Good morning, everybody. And it's uh, fantastic to be here. Um, we're able to reach out across the world. And, and this is an online fringe session that's going to run from 10 to 10.45. Um, and it's hosted by Pure Farming and powered by the Map of Agriculture. Um, it's titled Net Zero Future. It's a global perspective transitioning to sustainable farming future. And um, I think it's fantastic Then we talk about things globally with a fringe session like this online, we can reach out globally and we do have hundreds online. My name is Paul Temple. Uh, I'm going to just chair this session. I farm up in East Yorkshire, we're mixed farmers, and I myself have spent many years trying to make sense of sustainability. We've some great speakers here today. Unfortunately, Karen has been struck with COVID and is unable to make the event. However, that does give us a little bit more time for our other speakers. Please feel free to uh, enter your questions in the chat box and we'll hopefully get through some of them at the end of uh, our speakers. The title, as I say, has got global in it. And um, why not start at the other side of the world with Susan Kilby, who's working at 11 o'clock at night. She's an agricultural economist uh, with the ANZ, ANZ Bank in New Zealand. Uh, so, Susan, I'll hand over to you and if you can just give a quick introduction about yourself. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, thank, thanks so much for have, having me on, um, on board. Al alongside my um, day job as an agriculture economist with our, um, our largest rural bank in, in New Zealand, um, I'm also a farmer myself um, on what, by New Zealand standards, is an extremely small farm of um, 70 hectares. Um, and that um, we farm sheep and, and cattle on, on our own property here. And so um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's happening in New Zealand um, at the moment. Um, we're going through a, a period of quite rapid change in, in agriculture. I mean, as, as farmers, you all know that um, farming's always, always evolving, um, but at the moment we're going through quite a fast period of, of evolution um, and probably the last time we saw change of this sort of magnitude was back in the um, 1980s when we had farming subsidies removed um, completely from, from New Zealand and we had um, a big productivity gain where, where we all had to improve our productivity. Um, now the, the, the big sort of change is, is really around um, sustainability. So if we move to the next slide, um, what, um, what we are sort of working on in New Zealand at the moment, there's, um, there's a lot of um, regulatory change and there's also a lot of voluntary change um, that, that is occurring um, on, on our farms to meet sort of both environmental and um, social objectives. And this is coming across a number of areas, um, particularly um, water quality, making sure our, our waterways um, um, are, are continuing to be of a um, high quality, um, quality water, that we're not polluting our waterways um, through, through use of fertilizers and um, nutrient emissions from, from our animals, um, continuing to improve our animal welfare systems and also our um, employee um, health and safety standards, and the other area that we're, we're working on is um, looking to manage our greenhouse um, gas emissions. Um, and this is really quite a, quite a I, I guess, a world first really for um, um, agriculture systems to be um, looking to, to price, um, put a price on our agricultural emissions. So at the moment, our farmers are, are facing with a lot more compliance than what we used to. We've always been able to farm pretty freely in New Zealand with not a lot of rules. Um, that's cha changing rapidly. Um, we're also facing additional costs in re relation to compliance. And then also um, we will be paying for our emissions um, from 2025 onwards in terms of our methane emissions from, um, from our ruminants. Um, if you move on to the next um, slide, please. Um, in New Zealand, um, the way we manage, um, particularly our fresh water um, and most things to do with land are done at the regional level. So we've got 16 separate regions in New Zealand and this is um, particularly our water quality is managed at, at the regional level. Um, so while we have some national objectives um, around this, the day-to-day the -day practicalities um, occur at these regional levels. And so um, 
the rules differ quite a lot from, from region to region. So um, in Canterbury, which is on the um, east coast of the South Island, um, an area where we've seen rapid expansion of, of dairy on our flatlands with a lot more irrigation in, there is um, a lot of regulation in place already in terms of um, um, water quality and managing, um, managing um, the nutrient um, emissions there. Some of the other regions, which have been more tradition, particularly more tra uh, traditional dairying regions on the on the west coast uh, of the South Island, Taranaki in the North Island, um, and numerous other regions around New Zealand, we still have very few regulations. And um, so most farms don't require any consents um, for farming, um, but that's rapidly changing. And with that, that's um, being um, quite challenging for some of our farmers who have always farmed um, without having to um, worry about any consents. Um, or anything like that. It's not so much that they don't agree with the processes, it's just a big change. Um, and most of our farmers are farming because they like to be outdoors and, um, um, and work with their livestock as opposed to sitting in front of a computer and, um, and filling in consent. So that is um, causing a little bit of challenge um, for some people at, at the moment. If we move on to the next slide, um, if we look at in New Zealand in terms of our um, greenhouse gas emissions, we are very unique in the sense that half of our emissions come from agriculture um, and within that um, a large portion comes from the methane that's emitted um, from our ruminant animals, our cattle and sheep that we're, that we're farming. Um, in, terms of our, um, in terms of our electricity production and um, other emissions in New Zealand, we tend to have quite a green profile already. We use a lot of hydroelectricity. We're using quite, quite a lot of wind. Um, so there is um, limited, I guess, a limited ability to improve on, on that side. There is, there's obviously work being done, but um, in order to meet our, um, our targets, we really need to be managing our agricultural emissions um, as well, just because it makes up such a big um, portion of our, um, our emissions profile. If we move to the next slide, um, within New Zealand, we have a um, emissions trading scheme and, um, and that already covers quite a large number of sectors. Um, at the moment, agri agriculture, it was planned that agriculture would join our emissions trading scheme um, by 2025 unless, um, unless we came up with another way to price our um, agricultural emissions. So over the past um, year or 18 months, um, both our, our various um, agricultural industries um, and our government and, um, and also our iwi, our indigenous population, have been working together to come up with a plan around how we can price um, agricultural emissions. Um, that, that plan has sort of been, a, um, it was agreed within that group and, and recently went to government um, the government has come back with a slightly different plan and they're still working through some details around that. Um, but in short, by the end of this year, we should have a bit more clarity around what, what that plan will look like. Um, but it will basically involve um, modelling um, our emissions at, 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 um, on each individual farm um, based on um, a, a lot of factors like inputs and um, livestock numbers, um, various, how much feed's going into the systems, and that will model those emissions. And um, based on those modeled numbers, um, we will start paying for those emissions from 2025 onwards. There's still not um, a lot of detail around exactly how that's going to um, pan out, um, but we, at this stage, it's, it's looking like the costs relating to that will, won't be, um, won't be too onerous on our dairy sector because our dairy sector is very efficient um, in terms of the amount of milk we produce relative to emissions. Um, and it's also a relatively profitable sector um, at the moment. The biggest challenge will really fall on our sheep and beef farmers who tend not to be as profitable at the moment um, and also um, uh, create a lot more emissions um, producing, um, producing the lamb and beef um, that, we, that we grow on our farms. So some quite big challenges for, for that sector, um, but the details of how exactly it all paid out, we're still sort of working through, um, working through at the moment. If we move to the next slide, please. We, um, 
what, um, what we are finding in terms of what we need to do to model the emissions, um, it does mean we do need to record a lot more information on farms. Some farms are already recording a lot of this information, um, but some, some farms aren't, particularly our more extensive sheep and beef farms who may be only getting their livestock you know, into the yards a couple of times a year, tend not to have a lot of data and information um, on individual, individual animals. Um, whereas our dairy sector tends to have a lot more information. But um, the opportunities really is to um, the fact that we are going to have to um, collate this information for modeling purposes. We will also have this information available um, to help um, for, for general, um, general farming practices as well and, and becoming more efficient. Um, by having this data to hand, it's also going to provide a lot of environmental credentials um, for, for marketing um, to our consumers around the world. And increasingly, we're finding consumers are really concerned around um, the greenhouse gas emissions profiles of um, anything they, they consume. So um, that, that certainly is an advantage. Um, also, by paying our, our way um, as farmers, it also provides us a social license to farm in New Zealand. We're doing our bit just like the other, other industries will be doing in terms, to, in terms of reducing, um, in reducing um, emissions. Um, the challenges really um, come down to the fact that we are, are now or we're increasingly working in a more regulated environment, um, which we, our farmers aren't always used to. Um, there are higher operating costs. There's the cost of just uh, of just compliance. Um, there will be the um, the fees have have to be paid um, in terms of emissions. There's also been a lot of uncertainty um, as our, as these regulations are developing. And um, for instance, our, our regulations relating to freshwater have developed at different rates across different regions in New Zealand, and are still um, a lot of those rules are still under development. So there's a lot of farmers not knowing exactly how that will pan out in the future and whether um, they may have to reduce stocking rates or make some changes on farm in order to meet um, meet those, those rules going forward. Um, and we also, um, and the, also the other challenge is actually um, selling these goods to um, clients and finding the clients around the world that do value um, how we're farming in order to, um, um, I, I guess, get, gain higher prices um, to cover the cost of, of what we're selling as well. Um, you can move on to the next slide, but that's um, basically, um, I'm finished now. So um, I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Susan. And um, it's always fascinating to hear that regulation isn't just something that's um, a problem that faces UK farmers or European farmers. Um, it is something that we're all picking up on. And actually, that that talking of um, the needing to record more actually fits nicely onto our next speaker, uh, who's slightly nearer to us, uh, Professor John Gilliland from Northern Ireland, who's going to talk about his work in developing uh, sustainability baselines for every farms in a 45 million pound investment for Northern Ireland. So John, if you can just give a quick outline of yourself and uh, we'll we'll move on. Um, th thank you, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, first of all, can I uh, just take the opportunity to congratulate the Oxford Farming Conference on uh, uh, facilitating the, the problems of Ukraine. I uh, spent a year in Ukraine working with Rothenstedt, actually educating farmers uh, out there how to grow willows, how to use them to displace Russian gas. And I continuously get images from what is happening in Ukraine. And I'm horrified to see what's happened. So congratulations to the Secretariat. And my heart goes out to all the people I met in Ukraine while I worked out there. Can I also thank Mapa Bag for actually inviting me along and uh, to um, to just share some of the journey here um, that we've been doing in Northern Ireland. Now, I, I am slightly fighting the technology. Uh, that's better. I want to go back to my, my own background as such. I, for seven years, had the privilege of chairing an expert working group for the Northern Ireland government about developing a, a sustainable baseline in Northern Ireland, which now uh, has been rewarded by a £45 million public investment to baseline every tree, every hedge, uh, every field in Northern Ireland. I've been supported by my current employer, Devnish, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and by uh, Queen's University, Belfast. I am also a farmer and uh, a previous director of Oxford as well. 
Um, so what is this Northern Ireland Soil Nutrient Health Scheme and what are its objectives? Well, from the outset, when I was approached in uh, late 2014 by the Permanent Secretary of the, the then Department of Agriculture, the key thing we wanted to do was secure positive change of farmers to uh, put them on a journey that was more environmentally benign, but drive efficiency at the same time. We wanted to deliver multiple public goods uh, and we wanted to look at the breadth that just wasn't about carbon. So starting with soil, looking at soil health, soil fertility, looking at water health, looking at biodiversity and water, biodiversity in our landscape, looking at, for the first time, can we get a handle around what carbon stocks are out there? Because our journey to net zero isn't just about reducing emissions, it's also about increasing carbon stocks. So could we start to put some baselines in there? And doing it in a manner that we give really good quality information back to individual farmers. So just like Susan has said in New Zealand, we're looking to empower individual decision makers and individual businesses to make better quality decisions. The objective, we agreed with the Permanent Secretary that we would be ambitious and we were to secure consensus, that we would you know, lay out a pathway that would actually look at how we baseline every field, every tree, every edge. And we would do it in a way that would drive integrity and transparency, but particularly through a single vehicle. One of the difficulties of where we are now, there are a lot of players in here, all going with slightly different products, all measuring it in slightly different ways. Could we cut out the confusion and go with a single vehicle? So, in 2014, uh, I was asked to set up an independent expert working group, but make sure that that membership was inclusive, not just of farmers, but of key environmental NGO uh, representatives, people from the policy community, people from the food chain community. We actually published in October 2016, our sustainable land management strategy. And we were delighted when we published it and handed it to the minister, that we had written support from the chair of Northern Ireland Environment Link and from the president of the Ulster Farmers Union. I had the privilege of presenting it at a joint uh, 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 agriculture and environment uh, council meeting in Bratislava for the European Commission. And subsequently, they publicly came out and called it inspirational. But we didn't do it on our own. We did it as a public-private partnership. And I do want to give credit to my own employer, Devnish, because in 2013, they bought a farm of land and it went on a journey, the farm land's called Douth, and we really wanted to create what we call a ruminant landscape performance house and look at the interaction of animals and landscape together uh, to deliver multiple public goods. So we focused on soils, we focused on measuring carbon stocks, both below and above ground. We looked at where were our actual runoffs during extreme rainfall, uh, how were we impacting negatively the water? What could we do in land management options to mitigate that? We looked at our biodiversity, not only, and remember a lot, you know, more than half your biodiversity is below the soil. We had an extra complication because we also host one of Ireland's remaining herds of lowland wild red deer. And also too, we are a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And actually, it was the bringing of archaeologists and agriculturists together that really introduced us to some of the extraordinary digital technologies we've now used. So we took that learning and what do we do? We put it into the land management strategy. And the land management strategy is based on the key principle. If you can't measure, you can't manage. And really what we want to see is what could the current science do for us and where could it take us? So looking straight forward at soil fertility, I mean, we were horrified to see that only 18% of soils in Northern Ireland were at optimal fertility, of which soil pH was the biggest offender. So we looked at how you could measure and manage and repeat it every two years. And this is the particular journey we've been on from 2014 to 2020, where we've completely transparently changed our soil fertility in a way that is visible and has integrity. The second thing then is we wanted to build on a piece of work that had already been started in the Republic of Ireland by Chagas, uh, and that was looking at precision monitoring of water in our water courses, and how could we bring that north and do it 
uh, 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 on, on further uh, catchments, build discussion groups around it, and actually educate land managers of the cause and effect of what they do in the land and how it impacts on the water course. Because we were able to reach out for these new digital technologies, in our case, we've been using aerial LIDAR technologies, scanning uh, uh, somewhere between 15 to 40 scans per square meter. And it gives you this extraordinary topography of your, of your farm. And here you can see some of our work carried out by the Aggie Food and Bioscience Institute. Rachel Cassidy has been leading this work of looking at the roots of overland flow of extreme rainfall. And the reason this is important, certainly in Northern Ireland, 80% of the phosphate that goes into the water course actually happens during extreme rainfall events. So if you know where that water runs, you can do something about it. Where, and also to the flip side, where you don't have a problem, it allows you to have more freedom with that first spreading of slurry in the springtime after the close period. But you, you can also use the same digital technology with different pieces of software to actually then start to audit your above ground biomass. This image is actually of my own, our own farm outside the city of Derry. And it's looking at the LIDAR uh, uh, analysis of the above ground biomass. And you can see on the right hand side there the different uh, uh, heights uh, 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 of our woodland that we have here. And from that, we can build up a record of our carbon stock. So basically, we can create an asset register of our above ground biomass. And if we repeat that every five years, we can digitally measure change and additionality. So we took all of that and we placed it within the sustainable land management strategy. The recommendation of the strategy was to baseline the whole of Northern Ireland. When we published it, surprise, surprise, um, we had a bit of a pushback, too ambitious. I said, well, I prefer to be shot for being ambitious than uh, not being ambitious. Uh, so what we did secure, uh, courtesy of the Department of Agriculture and Environment and of the EU Exceptional Emergency Aid, we decided to do it on three river catchments, the Upper River Ban, River Colbert, River Strule, where AFPI went out and they managed to persuade 80% of the farmers in the catchment to let them come in and do precision soil sampling analysis, let them do uh, uh, precision water analysis, and also carry out the aerial uh, LIDAR surveys. Each farmer involved then were given detailed soil maps, uh, but we're also given these extraordinary things, these runoff risk maps. And that tells you exactly where does your water flow? Where does it discharge? Where have you got risk of nutrient spreading? Where have you not got risk? And these were enlightening, I have to say. And as a consequence, two years later, we put a team of social scientists in from Leeds University, and we found of the 80% of farmers engaged, 80% of those had made significant behavioral changes. And I'm delighted to say that the Upper, upper River Barn last year, for the first year in about 40 years, the phosphate levels in the water course actually dropped. So we were both picking up soft behavioral change measurements, but hard behavioral change measurements as well. As a consequence of that feedback that we saw that farmers would change their behavior if you gave them precise information about their farm, and you educate them, so if you empower them. So as a consequence then, uh, this time last year, our minister, Minister Edwin Putz, announced a, a 45 million pound investment over four years to baseline the whole of Northern Ireland. We're dividing it into four zones. Zone one was opened in May of 2022, closed at the end of August 2022 for applications. And uh, the plan is to do this every five years, but we'll go around, to, uh, around the, the province. Uh, next year, it'll be County Pamana and Pagha Karao Arma. And the whole idea is to get the whole province done in the next four years before we look to repeat it in five years' time. What we were absolutely delighted with, and we didn't uh, expect just such a positive outcome, is when the scheme, the Zone 1 applications closed at the end of August, 92% of all the farmers eligible were actually have had applied to the scheme and came in. So clearly a real interest in farmers. They want to know more about their journey. They want to know about their carbon stocks. They want to know about their fertility. They want to know about their impact on water quality. 
So when you facilitate them with this, they come on a journey with you. I just want to finish and say, for me, the success of our journey is, first of all, the process has been inclusive. Secondly, it's been a public-private partnership, and I think that has added to the integrity. It's one single scheme. So it doesn't cause confusion in the marketplace. It doesn't cause confusion with farmers. And at its core, it's about empowering all farmers with what knowledge we already know out there. We do have an increasing knowledge pipeline, but we already know an awful lot. Second thing is that, you know, we can deliver behavioral change, not just on water quality, not just on carbon, but on multiple public goods, including productivity of actually good, nutritious food, alongside cleaner water, more carbon stocks, less emissions, but it's based on one principle, measure, manage, then measure again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, you got through that in a remarkably short time, considering the amount of ground you covered. But uh, really enlightening when you, you hear of a 90% sign up, which um, um, is genuinely uh, a sign of success, right? We move finally and quickly on to our final uh, session, which is Hugh Martineau, who's head of sustainability of Map of Agriculture. And he's going to cover contextualizing greenhouse gas emissions to drive reduction on farm. Hugh, over to you. And if you can just give a quick outline of yourself. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, and thanks to the Oxford Farming Conference for putting on this uh, session today. Uh, really privileged to be able to speak to you all about some of the work that we're doing and hopefully building on some of uh, what Susan and John have already covered. What I really want to focus on today is around communication engagement of uh, greenhouse gas emissions measurement and monitoring activities. Um, so yeah, as Head of Sustainability, I'm uh, at Map of Ag. I'm very engaged with how we use information and data to generate a better picture of what's happening on the farm um, around greenhouse gas emissions. It's been a big focus for, for me since I joined the business two and a half years ago. Uh, Prior to that, I worked for uh, about 16 years in environmental consultancy, and prior to that, I was an agricultural advisor. Most of the work I was doing as an as a, uh, environmental consultant was uh, with policy research, looking at the impacts of various different measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, both, both at a sort of national inventory scale, but also very much at a farm scale, focusing around the farm system. One of the things I found going through that uh, sort of journey um, was that one of the big lacking uh, limiting factors was good activity data at a farm scale. And Susan touched upon this earlier in terms of some enterprises having better data than others. And the key to actually generating good, uh, useful information around greenhouse gas emissions is really having good quality activity data to populate uh, models to estimate greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not gonna go into that in lots of detail today. John uh, has covered a lot of the measurement and monitoring approaches, which are, uh, which has been excellent to hear about. What I want to look at is how we use that information and how we how do we make that information useful for farms? Because there is an increasing need to measure farm scale emissions. Um, it's only going to increase really. So we need to try and make that useful for farms. There's a range of good quality tools that are out there which can help. I'm I sit fairly uh, sort of agnostic to the tools that are available. What I really want to focus on is actually populating those tools with very good ac good activity data to make them as useful as it can be. But what we find in our uh, sort of day to day operations around this is that engagement is still a major limiting factor. We need to basically get to the point where this information that's being generated can be as useful as it can be for those farms. Uh, so how does it link to production efficiency is a key element to that. And I'm gonna to touch on that in a bit more detail. Uh, really what we want to get to is how does it improve um, decision-making on farm and drives the change that we're uh, needing. There are a number of push factors, as we all know. So policy direction in terms of commitments to international uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets are set out in the Paris Agreement. Um, they drive, from a sort of top down, then we've got processors and retailers who have their own uh, targets for emissions reductions from within their supply chain. So the so-called scope three emissions, the things that are upstream of those processes and retailers need to be accounted for uh, in meeting those targets. Again, we've got industry targets like the NFU target uh, for 2040 for net zero. And then there's 
financial institutions who also need to uh, report on their emissions associated with the lending facilities that they offer. So that's catchily phrased the task force for climate related financial disclosures. But basically what that means is that all lending needs to be accounted for from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective in the future. Now, all of these things circulate around farming that touches all of these uh, targets have touch points in farming. And it's sometimes a little bit unhelpful that um, we have slightly different objectives within those targets, all working towards that sort of net zero position, but national targets are focused on absolute emissions within our uh, sort of national boundaries. Supply chain and processors are looking at emissions intensity calculations around their scope three emissions and the financial sector are very much focused on the specific lending uh, or specific liability of the emissions associated with their lending. So somehow we've got to pull all these things together. So we're asking farmers questions once, not multiple times to meet multiple objectives. So we've then got to think about what are the pool factors for farmers? Why do they want to do this? What are the, the carrots that are available for farmers to really engage with this whole process? And it really is driven by farm efficiency, a lot of this. I've oversimplified it here and thinking about uh, the emissions are driven by bio biological processes, as we know. Um, but really, it's how do we optimize the nutrition in to generate the nutrition that we generate for farmers to meet that sort of consumption need? It's all very well sort of saying we need to cut emissions, but we also need to continue to meet the consumption need within our uh, efficient farming systems. Otherwise, there's a big risk that we end up exporting emissions to different parts of the globe, which may have less uh, uh, um, or, or worse sort of environmental conditions that they're growing things within. So we need to be conscious of that. And what it really boils down to is the sort of engine rooms of our, of our agricultural systems. How do we optimize the nutrition we're bringing into the system to maximize nutrition out? And these two engine rooms are the bits that generate emissions, but also uh, are the bits that process things in the way we need them to. So in terms of the cow or their ruminant animal that processing uh, the nutrition that we can't digest into something that we can. Equally with soils, how do we optimize organic matter in order to cycle nutrients in the most efficient way? So really the pursuit of nutrient circularity within our systems is, is key to driving efficiency and reducing the amount of input emissions that we generate on farm. This is the bit that I think really starts to engage, uh, engage the farms in terms of the efficiency uh, benefits that we can get from looking at greenhouse gas emissions. But we also need to be very conscious that there are external factors that affect our production systems. So the weather, for one, uh, is, is a big influencing factor. So we can baseline our greenhouse gas emissions today, but actually that might be quite different next year than it was to the previous year, depending on what those sort of weather impacts on our production systems are. So then getting into the sort of contextualization of the emissions. How do we understand and communicate these things? We've all sort of seen, or we've possibly all seen what an emissions calculation looks like. And when we look at the emissions intensity factor, what does that actually mean? So we need to get to a point where we can provide guidance on the levels of opportunities within those biological processes. And this is where I start to talk about sort of this concept around the theoretical minimum. And this is really the point at which an enterprise is working at optimum efficiency. Uh, where the emissions are effectively as low as they can be based on the biological processes that they're working within. And that's going to vary from year to year, depending on the weather. It will change over time, depending on the innovation which comes our way. So whether that's in the form of uh, methane inhibitors, nitrification inhibitors, other um, uh, innovation that will come along, really, we want to get the, the emissions put in perspective so that we can set realistic targets. So understanding how low can we actually go within the emissions uh, is, is important uh, so that we can show what them and demonstrate what emissions reductions are available. And that's where we've been doing some work to look at sort of key performance indicators for overall production efficiency, which drive down emissions calculations. So they allow farmers to adapt input parameters that influence the emissions intensity. And the key ones here are really looking at nitrogen use efficiency, herd and flock fertility, feed use efficiency, growth rates and fuel efficiency to a slightly lesser extent. And the dashboard I've got there is just a dynamic tool that we've built for a cropping system. So you can put in all your input parameters and see how that influences the greenhouse gas emissions. It's not set out to replace 
sort of uh, very detailed greenhouse gas emissions calculations, but it gives a really strong indication of where the emissions are arising, the influences of things like nitrogen within the system, and then what can you do to actually drive greater nitrogen use efficiency as a sort of uh, consultancy tool. This has proven very useful. Equally within the dairy sector, uh, in the UK, generally speaking, we've got an emissions profile of somewhere between one and 1.3 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of milk produced within a sort of normal distribution. The UK average said to be about 1.25. We've done some calculations which basically suggest a theoretical minimum somewhere between 0.8 and 0.85 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. So it gives an indication of where the opportunity range for emissions reduction is. And generally speaking, if you're more efficient now, you're, you're your marginal gains are going to be slightly less overall. So it helps sort of contextualize what the opportunity is and where to target those emissions reductions. Similarly, with the beef sector, we've developed some tools which just basically allow you to sort of input your key parameters around things like fertility, feed use, daily live weight gain and growth rates, which actually help you uh, understand where you are today. But then obviously, where can you get to as a sort of theoretical minimum from within your farm system? The one thing I'd like to say on that is it's this is not about driving intensity. This is about finding the optimum the optimum position for any given farm environment, whether that's an extensive system or an intensive system. Generally speaking, there's always some degree of efficiency gain that can be made. And then so just finally, um, understanding and quantifying the emissions reductions opportunity is, is essential so we can communicate uh to farmers what the opportunity level is for emissions reduction and also set appropriate targets that's good for engagement with farmers but also helps communicate things through the supply chain and out to uh, consumers of the the products that we're producing as well it really helps to sort of say well actually we're as efficient as we can be within this production system or we're working towards that uh that position and also just that point around things change from year to year depending on on the weather baselining activity is so important but it will fluctuate year to year um this concept of linking things to performance kpis i think is essential i think there'll come a point where we have this a, a more of an integrated system where we're not necessarily isolating emissions calculations from uh, business performance but it's completely integrated and we have basically greenhouse gas emissions indications uh built into some more performance uh priorities and just that final point there, use, use good data for whatever tool or emissions calculations you're performing, use good data, otherwise it's a waste of time and money effectively. It's not really generating the, 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 um, the outcomes that we need. So by using good data, we can understand much better what the baseline position is and how to progress from that point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugh. All right, well, we'll move quickly on to some questions. We've got a few in the chat box. I've had one that's come through in a different route. This is a quick question for you, Susan. Uh, with increased regulation, which relates to delivery of social good, is it inevitable that eventually New Zealand farmers will need to be compensated or subsidised by the government for their actions? Um... I mean, certainly it's some of what's happening is adding to costs on farm, but there's certainly no, um, I think there's no plans from um, any government, whether it be the current government or the opposition at the moment to, to compensate um, farmers at all. It, it'll, it'll be more around um, evolution of our, of our farming systems and making sure we can remain profitable within these systems. Um, it is likely we will see our um, um, some land use change and um, the total size of our agricultural systems um, could shrink. Whether we can offset the reduced um, land use with increased productivity or not remains to be seen, um, but uh, we certainly won't be continuing to grow our agricultural um, sector like we have over the last few decades. Yeah, okay. A few questions for John. I don't know if you can see them, but um, the, the one I think is really interesting, and, and you partially answered it, was uh, when monitoring every field in Northern Ireland, how receptive have farmers been to this? Uh, and was it difficult to get on all on board? Did you find as you were going through the process, John, they were more engaged? Um, I, I think it, the fact that we have 92% of eligible farmers apply, I think you'll find that we did get engagement. But the process engagement was 
you know, it's, we started this journey in 2014. It's been a very in inclusive process. It's been a very transparent in process. And a lot of people have been engaged through this. But also in fairness, you know, we, uh, every organization threw their shoulder to the wheel. When the application process was open, everybody, there was a united message because of it's one instrument, it's a public private partnership. Whether you're an environmental NGO, whether you're the Ulster Farmers Union, whether you're the Grain Trade Association, you all went out and supported the Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute Department, and we all threw a shoulder to the wheel. So it was a collective effort because actually, you know, all farmers at the end of the day don't like, and bear in mind Northern Ireland agriculture is predominantly ruminant agriculture, which is the one that's most in the dock at the moment, has this monkey on their back saying they're guilty before they've had a chance to prove themselves innocent. Um, so uh, farmers are getting quite a bit out of this in regards, they're getting unique information about their own farm, which they've never seen before. So going with one hand, uh, uh, where you're actually giving them information to make them better at their decision making. So what we've seen in these businesses is actually they've become more efficient, but at the same time, they've reduced their environmental footprint. That certainly was the case in the pilots. And the pilot people, you know, the pilot farmers became ambassadors. And so that has helped us too. So we, I mean, I myself was, I mean, if, if we had got a 70, 80% over the line, I would have been delighted. 92%, I was blown away. And I will, you know, absolutely want to go on record to thank the farming industry for rising to the challenge, but also everyone else out there who put their shoulder to the wheel. We couldn't have done it without a united effort. Well, sadly, I, I've picked up a message that we're, we're wrap up time. Um, it was great to have your questions, all really valid, some fabulous um, thinking from our presenters that managed to do it in such short slots of speaking for such a complex subject. So I, I will pass you back. What I would like to just mention before we finish is that there will be um, at the Oxford Farming Conference some hospitality offered by uh, Pure Farming and Powered Map of Agriculture, and uh, the conversation will no doubt continue there. So back to Oxford Farming Conference.